Hello, and welcome to the Ask Historians digital conference session, Players Gonna Play, 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 History and Games, Games and History. My name is Sarah Gilbert, and I will be chairing this session. This panel explores the ways in which historical settings and peoples are often misrepresented in tabletop and video gaming systems, a theme that will be explored from different angles and contexts by each of our speakers during the session's roundtable discussion. Before we begin this session, however, we would like to acknowledge that the Ask Historians Digital Conference is taking place on the ancestral, unceded, and treaty territories of many Indigenous peoples who have stewarded this land since time immemorial. We offer our gratitude to these peoples and recognize that colonial nations continue to benefit from the brutality that enabled the original settler colonizers to seize these lands. The Ask Historians Digital Conference organizers acknowledge both the land upon which we are virtually holding this conference and the deep-rooted and long-lasting harms caused by white imperialism and settler colonialism. We invite you to read our full land acknowledgement in the video description below. Our first speaker is Jason Dyer. Jason works for a technology company in San Francisco and has maintained the All Adventures project at his blog Rango in Blue since 2011, endeavoring to play and document every adventure game ever made. He has degrees in mathematics and fine arts and is a digital humanities and interactive fiction enthusiast. His paper is entitled Reconstructing the Sierra Leone Game. Before I start, I want to credit the historians Devin Monin and Kate Willer, who did the initial research and in all this. I'm just building off what they started. Today, I'm going to talk to you about two games that were from a set of three, eventually written up in a final report as the production and evaluation of three computer-based economic games for the sixth grade. This set is of particular interest to historians, not only because it is so early in computer game history, 1964, only two years after Space War, but because one of the games in the set had far-reaching influence that can be felt to this day. The influential game I am speaking of is not the Sierra Leone game, that is the game named in the title of my paper, it's another of the set of three called the Sumerian game. After the project ended, the Sierra Leone game fell into complete obscurity. And through indirect circumstance, the Sumerian game spawned an entire genre of gameplay. So I will discuss the overall project first, then the Sumerian game, and then finally, the object of my reconstruction, the Sierra Leone game. The third game of the set, the Free Enterprise game, has its own interest, but I will be passing over it as the Sumerian game and the Sierra Leone game make a pair of sorts for reasons I'll get into. The project which resulted in three economics games was the initial conception of Dr. Nobel J. Gividen, the superintendent in Northwest Westchester County, New York, and was a collaboration between teachers of that district and IBM. Dr. Gividen had a general interest in technology to improve education and also wrote a paper while the project was still running about rural schools where programming lessons may be delivered instantaneously through typewriter council screens and speakers, and that students would work in, quote, simulated environments like the Library of Congress, atomic energy laboratories, and be able to, quote, play the role of a priest king in Sumeria. The last quote about the priest king is referring to the Sumerian game, which after some initial meetings became one of the main games developed by the project. The initial concept was by Bruce Moncrief of IBM, and designed by the teacher Mabel Addis. This incidentally makes Mabel Addis currently hold the record as the first female game designer. The idea was to first introduce ancient Sumer via slide sync to audio, some of which exist and are stored at the Strong Museum of Play in New York, and cast the student as the ruler of the city state of Lagash. The game was then played via an IBM 1050 terminal which connected via data phone to an IBM 7090 mainframe. The game prompted the player with these decisions each turn defined as a six month span. Uh, how many bushels of grain do you wish to feed your people? And how many bushels of grain do you want planted for the next crop? The game would then simulate having this royal steward execute the commands and return in six months. Sometimes a random event would happen like a plague that the player would have to anticipate. The game's code itself no longer exists, although we have a sample transcript of the entire first phase of the game. In 1969, Doug Diamond at Digital Equipment Corporation was giving a talk where afterwards a grad student approached him and described the Sumerian game. 
Mr. Diamond thought it would be a good candidate as a demonstration program and wrote a compressed version filling a minuscule 4K in the Focal 8 programming language. This version made it to Dave All and the book 101 Basic Computer Games as Hammurabi, one of the most famous of all com early computer programs. A reference point for simulation games after, for example, in reviews for Danielle Berry's 1984 game Mule, I'll give you two quotes. Mule is a cross between Hammurabi, diplomacy, and an arcade game. Second quote, basically a strategy game. Mule combines some of the best competitive features of Monopoly with economic simulation games like Kingdom. Kingdom is just an expansion of Hammurabi written in the 70s. And both these quotes were written in 1984, remember, and the game was back in the early 60s with the very first version. Switching to the other game of our concern. The Sierra Leone game was written by Walter Goodman. The writing was assisted by Frank Carefa Smart from the staff of the United Nations and brother of Dr. John Carefa Smart, the first foreign minister of Sierra Leone. This makes it the earliest known computer game with a designer from Africa. To quote Goodman's own description of the game. In the Sierra Leone game, the people plays the part of an AID officer in modern Sierra Leone. After taking a simulated tour of the country, he is assigned to each of the three provinces of Sierra Leone, one after another, and gives advice to the local administrators about their economic problems, such as land reclamation, price control, and even gross national product allocations. If he is successful in advising the country of these problems, he is promoted with an AID. The desire was to simulate the economic issues of newly independent African countries. Sierra Leone was picked as having political factors be less critical in complicating the simulation. For example, by contrast, the Congo was undergoing violence after Patrice Lumumba was assassinated only a few years before. Like the Sumerian game, there is an intended introduction with slides, although it is described as having lectures and simple branching, so it is not based on an audio recording like the Sumerian game was. The three phases are Northern province, allocating production of onions, Eastern province, managing rice supply, and Southern province, directing the government to support agriculture, mining, and manufacturing. Intending learnings were, for example, a favorable balance of trade exists when exports exceed imports. And, quote, a few companies operate the diamond market and exercise monopolistic control over it. Unlike the Sumerian game, there are no surviving textual excerpts but there are complete flowcharts of each phase. It is unknown exactly how much role-playing there was. The Sumerian game cast the student as a ruler and did messages in character, whereas the descriptions of the Sierra Leone game make it sound more minimalist. In any case, we can still recreate and follow the logic of the game to see what simulation games of the early 1960s were like. It really is worthwhile to not just read descriptions about these games, but to play them. There is important content within the gameplay itself. For example, the original focal source code for Hammurabi, that's the version that was passed on in 1969, was recently recreated by a blogger going by the Data Driven Gamer, who worked out the optimal strategy was to play by not feeding anyone at all. Quote, everyone starves to death every turn, but an empty city full of land repopulates very quickly. And with so much grain saved by not feeding people, you can afford to buy more and more land. One thing the experimenters did with the Sumerian game and the Sierra Leone game is pit them head to head in an actual educational experiment. The Sumerian game was more successful both in enjoyment and in teaching the actual topics intended. That is, they pre-tested and post-tested the economic knowledge they were intending to convey. After playing the Sierra Leone game, I can explain why. The Sumerian game and the imitations after include elements of randomness and the unpredictability means that as long as you haven't discovered an extreme strategy like starving all your citizens, there is some depth in anticipating what might happen next and making multiple plans for accounting for a good crop year versus a bad one. The Sierra Leone game lacks this depth. The loop in all three phases, Northern, Eastern, and Southern, is a simple mathematical formula with no variation. And the optimal strategy really is intentionally in the extreme. The final report even explains that optimally in the Northern province round, all money should be spent every round as the best approach. 
it becomes obvious quickly that the experience is not very game-like. It feels akin to using a calculator that loops over and over as opposed to responding in character as a ruler trying to steer a kingdom. So here is a fundamental lesson of game design arising even from the very earliest experiments. The bare form not it only is gratifying in a historical sense as it lets us see the contours of ideas early in game history, but the, that the principles of depth, narrative, and mimesis, that is uh, being like a real environment rather than a fake one, still held and made themselves evident even in those early days. It is possible to induce that this might be the case just from looking at the algorithm, but there is no duplicate to the experience of actual play from reconstructing this year early on game and getting a true sense of what was realized early on by Mabel Addis, designer of the Sumerian game. Thank you, Jason. Our next speakers are Adam Beerstead and Emmett Taylor. Adam has an MA in Viking and Medieval Norse Studies from the University of Iceland and is working on a second MA in Library and Information Sciences. His research interests include legendary sagas, human environment interactions in medieval Scandinavia, and modern reception of the Vikings, particularly in video games. He does public historical outreach through game analysis on Twitch and YouTube under the name Ludo History. Emmett is a doctoral student at University College Cork. Their research explores the concept of the hero in medieval Irish literature, how the concept develops, and how it changes throughout the medieval period. They're particularly interested in the modern reception and remediation of medieval Celtic literature, history, mythology, especially in tabletop role-playing games and video games. They are part of the editorial team for the Association of Celtic Studies of Ireland and Britain and are one of two managers of the association's blog. Their paper is titled, Corporeal Corruption, Skulls as Non-Christian Religious Signifiers in Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Assassin's Creed Valhalla is perhaps the most detailed rendering of the Viking world ever put to code. The game takes place during the 9th century invasions of the great Viking army in England, Ireland, and Francia, and consequently portrays numerous different religions. Aver, the player character, who we will refer to with they, them pronouns because the game has biologically female and male versions, is a Norse pagan who grows increasingly disillusioned with their gods, particularly the cruel and capricious Odin. At the same time, they also contend against Christianity embodied in Alfred the Great of Wessex. Christianity is the dominant religion in England, but many story arcs engage with other religious identities in the game. Various Celtic paganisms in Gloucestershire and Ireland, Old English paganism among the zealots of the Order of the Ancients and the Daughters of Larian, and Roman paganism in the religious shrines and ruined temples that 9th century England is built on top of. However, the 9th century imagined by the game is deeply ahistorical in its religious plurality. For instance, the central conflict the player is thrust into during their time in Ireland is conflict between Christian kings and pagan druids, despite the conversion of Ireland concluding in the 7th century. Similarly, it is difficult to speak of a significant Old English, much less Roman or pre-Roman Brythonic paganism, like what appears in Gloucestershire, after about 750 at the latest. Even Norse paganism is a highly distorted form of itself, appearing visually and narratively unified contrary to the intensely disunified practices that are suggested by archeological and place name analyses in Scandinavia. It therefore is constructing an imaginary reality with numerous equally valid religious identities. While the game appears to have a vested interest in avoiding making value judgments about the various religions present, value judgments can still be seen particularly in the presence and use of human skulls. Therefore, we propose a three of their typology based around skulls, which reveals the exoticism and moral coding of the game towards these religious identities. Type one has no skulls. Type two has skulls detached from the human form and type uh, three obscures the human face with these skulls. Two religious identities occupy the outer layer of this typology, Christianity and Roman paganism. Rightly, monasteries and churches exist in nearly every town in England and are frankly kind of dull. Uh, dark stone exteriors, pewed interiors with stained glass windows and white stone altars, skulls, and more broadly bones, are instead relegated to catacombs and sarcophagi where they are comfortably contained. This is a distortion. Saints relics were often human remains and would be featured predominantly in a saint's site. 
instead of bone relics, veneration of saints is relegated to often anachronistic statues and invocations. Pre-Christian Roman religion, the other type one religion, is correctly presented as extinct in 9th century England. However, the game world overflows with the physical remains of a Roman past. Of these remains, the game puts particular emphasis on religious sites, such as the Temple to Mithras in London and statues of Roman deities, such as Venus and Victoria, found scattered throughout the game world. Just as with the game's depiction of Christianity, these Roman religious sites are skull-less in their original forms. This absence of skulls in a religious context draws comparisons between Christianity and pre-Christian Roman religion, coding both as most akin to a player's average experience. Most people today don't see skulls on a daily basis, I at least hope. Moving to the second type of religious practice, Norse paganism is effectively defined in-game by the presence of skulls. A telling example is the seeress Valka's hut. She is helpful unlocking the two mythological story arcs in the game and effectively serving as Eivor's therapist. However, her house has no fewer than 30 bleached human skulls around, often dangling from the ceiling, and this passes without comment. Now, while human sacrifice, including occasional decapitation, was practiced, there is little evidence to suggest that the skull would be displayed in the way we see in-game. The game doesn't care though, and so shows off both human and animal skulls. A second example can be seen by comparing Kilchrist Church in Dublin with Stavanger Norway's temple. Both are in fact Christian Stavkirker, a wooden church style popular in 12th century Norway. However, Stavanger's is intended as a pagan temple, and therefore is lined floor to ceiling with animal skulls. Kilchrist, because it is Christian, escapes this treatment. Skulls therefore seem to pass without comment as the definitive marker of paganism. In Ireland, we are shown a similar phenomenon to Valka's hut with the hut of Deirdre the Druid. One of two friendly Druids the player encounters in Ireland, Deirdre serves as a source of exhibition. Just like Valka, her hut is surrounded with skulls. They hang outside her roundhouse, they sit on tables inside and generally adorn this religious site. In Gloucestershire in England, the player entirely inexplicably encounters a druid, Halewyn, who helps the player. As with Deirdre, uh, Halewyn's cottage has an entire external wall dedicated to shelves and nets displaying dozens of human skulls. In both of these cases, these helpful Celtic religious figures are surrounded by skulls, but they never adorn their bodies with them, placing both in type two of the game's religious typology. Comparatively, the antagonistic druids found in Ireland, the children of Danu, adorned their religious sites and their bodies with skulls. All six generic enemy types of druids that the player will encounter have skulls uh, or a skull adorning their head. Skulls concealing the face is shown as a marker of their druidry, as six special druids the player encounters who are hiding among the general population do not wear any. Their companions, however, for other druids who are encountered apart from broader society, wear skulls over their faces just as their subordinates. The druidic armor set that the player can find in Ireland covers their face with a human skull. Also found the mythical armor set that can be bought from the in-game store. Centers of worship for these druids also have an abundance of skulls, such as Lochan Skull, which has piles of skulls heaped under altars and strange humanoid figures made of twigs and stag skulls. Back in England, the clearest examples of Old English paganism come to us from the Daughters of Larian, three optional bosses named Cordelia, Regan, and Goneril. These figures explicitly mention Thunor and Woden, and one of them drops a copy of the Nine Herb Charm, an Old English poem that mentions Woden by name. They are also very problematically bone-wearing hags. The worst defender here is Cordelia, who wears a helmet made out of four skulls. This is obviously designed to shock the audience and code them as heinous enough to deserve death. Their deceased father, Larian, is no better. In his villa, there's a statue of Aquarius with a goat skull in front of the Roman face and a stag skull behind, creating a leering profile that is unmistakably that of Baphomet. Old English paganism is at that moment coded as literally Satan, justifying its ostracization. Larian's daughters, however, aren't the only people to wear human skulls throughout the game. The random bandits that dot the landscape also do. 
From the moment the player lands in England, skulls blended into helmets leap from every bush and burnt farm. Apart from the practical consideration of large-scale heretical grave defilement, it dehumanizes bandits. They're already dead, and you can return them to death with no ethical quandaries. However, this has religious coding as well. The game appears to assume folk identities were pagan in early medieval England and reflects it not so secretly in human bone, marking bad religions and bad people with the wearing of human skulls. Similarly to the outlaws, uh, the player encounters Picts along the northern border, who are uh, visually designed based on Roman descriptions from the second century rather than the ninth the game takes place in. In generic art, these figures uh, have human skulls on their belt and conceal their head with uh, ram skulls, even though they have been Christian for several centuries. In doing so, the game casts their Christianity into doubt, deeply and problematically drawing on the firmly outdated and incorrect visual language of savages. Assassin's Creed Valhalla creates a consistent visual language for religions depicted inside the imagined ninth century of Northwestern Europe. Religions without skulls, Christianity, and pre-Christian Roman religion, who are, which are the most familiar to the modern Western audience of the game, are untouched by human remains and are communicated to the player as familiar and safe. Religions with skulls on display, uh, Norse and friendly Celtic paganisms use skulls to give the appropriate vibe to the audience. These religions are cast as mysterious, but not dangerous to the player. Religions with skulls that conceal the face, Old English and antagonistic Celtic paganisms communicate visually with the player that these characters are antagonistic, not just to humanizing them by stripping these characters of their faces, but making them into skull-based monsters. Thank you. Thank you, Adam and Emmett. Our final speaker is Adam Franti. Adam is an adjunct professor of history at Grand Rapids Community College and earned his master's degree in history from Eastern Michigan University in 2018, focusing on military and cultural history of North America. He's worked on research projects for the National Park Service and presented research at international conferences. He's particularly interested in the ways that culture and popular culture influences politics and warfare. His paper is titled, Not Naturally Adapted to Horseback, Race and Race Theory in Dungeons and Dragons. Dungeons and Dragons was released originally in the 1970s. It's a fantasy tabletop role-playing game. It was based on a popular medieval combat game called Chainmail, and it added fantasy elements such as magic and monsters into the game that was about tactical warfare and earning loot by defeating enemies. Players had to create characters, choose their class, choose armor and weapons, and most notably, choose their race. Uh, initially human, elf, or dwarf. Once the party was made up, players would be guided by their dungeon master through dungeons or dangerous locations filled with treasure and traps and fight monsters like orcs. The way that D&D broke down these races is probably very familiar to people, even if they haven't played D&D. They are, to a certain extent, default in the pop culture narrative of the United States. The presence in the game is meant to offer the player a wider degree of choice and customization. So like classes, each race has characteristics that relate to how they modify the player's dice rolls. The first edition handbook of uh, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons describes these races as follows. Humans initially are not given a description. They're considered more or less default. Everybody who plays the game is human, so it doesn't really need to be much elaboration on what they're like. Elves, on the other hand, live in forest cities and protect nature. They appreciate beauty and harmony and get along well with the animals of the forest. They are often fascinated by magic. Uh, dwarves live in underground cities carved in precise detail from stone. They like gold and gems. They are powerful warriors and resistant to magic. So uh, these are uh, storytelling features of the game as well as mechanical features of the game. Um, dwarves, for instance, have magical resistance. They are resistant to magical attacks from enemies, whereas elves are very fluent with magic. And so they get sort of extra moves and extra features uh, as they go through and progress through these dungeons to earn things. So elves and dwarves um, have these advantages to their attributes that make them play slightly differently uh, than each other. And you can kind of add a little bit more character to the role that you're playing within the game by playing the same class with a different race. All right, so this makes sense from a game design uh, aspect. And it's also, again, very familiar through kind of the pop culture elements that make up the inspiration for Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, obviously, uh, the, the idea that elves are magical, dwarves are not magical, humans kind of sort of sit in the middle of this um, is something that's very based on the pop culture inspiration 
for the game, right? But these racialized features are also present in the monster races, and in particular, orcs. There are obvious colonialist elements to the representation of orcs who are described as living in tribes, who are hostile, physically strong, but often subservient to tyrannical masters who sometimes use magic in order to manipulate their size and ferocity for ill ends. Uh, they are also weakened in sunlight and prefer fighting in, at night or in caves. So anyone even fa passingly familiar with fantasy literature or pop culture will probably have known most of these elements. It's very strongly entrenched within the genre. But I'm interested in where it came from. Why are these different features explained as racial differences? And how do they have such saying power even outside of role-playing games where those tiny little mechanical advantages make an extreme difference in how you actually play the character? The obvious inspiration for many of these elements is Tolkien's Middle Earth. From the word use like orc to the physical features, Tolkien was a clear basis for many of these races. But interestingly, Tolkien isn't even mentioned in the first edition's list of inspirations. In the foreword to the first edition, Gary Gygax, the creator, wrote the following. These rules are strictly fantasy. Those war gamers who lack imagination, those who don't care for Burroughs' Martian adventures where John Carter is groping through black pits, who feel no thrill upon reading Howard's Conan saga, who do not enjoy the, the, the camp and Pratt fantasies or Fritz Lieber's Fafard and the Grey Mouser pitting their swords against evil and sorceries will not be likely to find Dungeons and Dragons to their taste. So I just want to kind of go through the, the inspiration here because while I think a lot of people might default to the idea that Dungeons and Dragons was inspired by Tolkien directly, he's not even mentioned. Instead, we have uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs, we have Robert E. Howard, and we have Fritz Lieber, among a couple of others. Uh, I want to point out that Edgar Rice Burroughs' main character in his most popular series, John Carter, was a Confederate captain. He was a literal Confederate after the Civil War who hid in a magical cave to escape attack by Indians and ended up on Mars. And this is only the first and by no means the last bluntly direct parallel between Burroughs Martians and American Indians. Carter himself makes overt attempts to civilize the green Martians, the, the so-called good guys uh, in his series to Southern American values, to, to basically trying to carve out a new antebellum South on Mars. Robert E. Howard probably doesn't need too much of a discussion in terms of his uh, the way he represents race in many of his fictions, but even within just his sword and sorcery uh, genre, his Conan books, uh, they also have a, a very similar fascination with race and racial traits. Howard also wrote an unfinished short story that has been repeatedly published on white nationalist websites for its obvious racial components. Uh, it's pretty safe to say that he has some uh, fairly problematic takes uh, on race. Um, throughout there. Fritz Lieber, of course, also writing within the genre. Fritz Lieber was also writing uh, directly in response to the popularity of Burroughs and Howard, also uses sort of a racialized setting that makes overt connections to his fictional Eastern lands to a mishmash of Anatolian and Middle Eastern societies. He also wrote a war game to accompany his Grey Mouser world, and components of which were later adapted to later editions in Dungeons and Dragons. So the fascination with race, the fascination with the idea of these differences in cultures being manifested as essential inherent traits that kind of live in the blood of different types of people throughout these fantasy worlds comes from somewhere, right? It's pervasive throughout the genre, but it does have an intellectual grounding that comes down from a very long tradition that dates almost as far back as even the ancient Middle Ages. One of the first articulations of this idea was Isidore of Seville, who connected the idea of the mythical monstrous birth. So something like Grendel, the Minotaur, uh, et cetera, to a monstrous race, uh, a whole race of beings like this who lurked on the borders and in the shadows of the known world. The idea remains somewhat in the background as much medieval and early modern thought divided people into what we might call, call or consider classes, divisions of inclusion and exclusion that clustered on notions of citizenship and belonging more generally rather than race or blood. Uh, this started to change after the Reformation. Uh, Jean Baudin, writing in 1565, made a recognizable grouping of world populations into racial categories, proposing a schematic grouping of the world into Scythian, German, African, and Midler, divided according to the form of the body and distinguished by color. A further division into Mediterranean, Baltic, and Midler uh, retained the tripartite structure and invested it with characteristics distinguishable by the senses, voice, eye color, and body form. Thus, the blackness of the African and the whiteness of the Scythian, the old division between man and brute, was no longer wholly dependent on 
ancient classical sources, but more on the patent forensic analysis of habits and mind and body and upon the visible effects of the reproduction and migration. Ivan Hannaford argues that the racialization of the Western world didn't occur until after the Reformation. So in the 1560s, in the 1570s, and didn't really mature into the particular expression of race as a science until the period of about 1870 to 1914. Post-Reformation thinkers, in particular Thomas Hobbes and John Locke, certainly contributed to the historical canon that later theorists would invoke, the introduction and exploitation of enslaved African labor in the new world, along with adapted attitude to the indigenous populations around the world, contributed to the accelerating idea of races with particular inherent inborn traits, a notion that proved irresistible to 19th century academics. Jean Friedrich Bruenbach uh, in the mid 19th century articulated many of the features of the diversity of these theories um, into essentially kind of constraining it through the sieve that saw the entire world made up of a few salient races. One of the, the clearest was uh, Carl Linnaeus, who categorized men into four categories, wild men, European white men, red Americans, yellow Asians, and black Africans. And this is a probably fairly familiar division uh, that we still sometimes see passing reference to throughout the world in pop culture, in casual conversation everywhere. These ideas gave a ready explanation for the state of the world and the relative difference in perceived social complexity and technological sophistication and gave an intellectual case for the further exploitation, extirpation, and enslavement of indigenous populations around the world. Now, bringing this back to the idea of D&D and kind of role-playing this idea, there is a theory that's put forward in a book called Racial Worldmaking that essentially says that the way that sword and sorcery in particular deals with creating the idea of race is not necessarily to put down some kind of scientific idea of the difference between people, but to teach us when, where, and how race is something to notice. So noticing race in some contexts and not others shapes how we organize situations, forms of reasoning, and expectations about what is going to happen. And this works both within a player world, something like Dungeons and Dragons, and we also kind of take this back and apply it to the real world as well. In other words, the knowledge built into inhabiting the secondary world frames the reader's knowledge of the primary world. So the origins of the racial components of the tabletop role-playing games way predate the popular fiction that inspired it. They were a staple of Western academic thought and had their zenith in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. This is around the same time that Burroughs, Lieber, and Howard were carving out the sword and sorcery genre. But because of the nature of the tabletop gaming and the demands it makes on players to inhabit the world, racial characteristics of the game helped to create an intellectual feedback loop of sorts in which the real world helps to understand the fantasy world and the fantasy world is then laid over top of the real world. What this means is that players, game makers, and pop culture inspired by it tend to carry these dated ideas and assumptions forward and contribute to attitudes of people in the real world. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. And thank you all for your insightful papers this afternoon. Now that we've completed the paper presentation portion, we will be moving into our moderated panel discussion to expand more on the themes of the panel and dive deeper into some of the topics that um, you've all mentioned in your presentations. Um, should any of the audience members want to continue the discussion, please join us for the live Q&A thread hosted on the Ask Historian subreddit. So for our first question to start us all off, I'd love to learn more about why each of you picked the topic that you did. So I, I um, first heard about the Severian game actually not that long ago. Um, they're, they're the historian uh, Kate Willer, who I already mentioned, wrote about it and also Devin's research into it as well. And I, I was um, fairly fascinated uh, by the, the fact that it was part of this project where there was, it was only one part of it, that there were these other two parts. And so, I mean, the first thing that immediately occurred to me is, well, what happened to the other two parts? I mean, this part became famous, but were the other two parts interesting? And um, the uh, other two parts were interesting. The, the part that ended up being kind of connected was the, the Sierra Leone game, but there was uh, no way to play it. Nobody had even really heard about the game except for the small group of, of historians. So I decided I, I really need to try this thing and reconstruct it and see what happens in comparison and, and see if I can learn something. And for our paper, uh, it actually came out of my Twitch streams. Uh, I went through all of Assassin's Creed Valhalla, and in fact, I'm continuing to do so with the new Francia DLC. But uh, Emmett graciously joined me for the when uh, the trip through Ireland, and we were struck so strongly by uh, Deirdre's hut, the friendly druid we met, that we decided to dig in more to see what was going on because uh, she had 
both Norse runes and skulls and just a lot happening all at the same time uh, right there. And we realized very quickly that it was a very broad pattern. And there's a lot, very common pop culture theme of uh, adorning druids with skulls, particularly animal skulls. Uh, you see this in, for instance, as we've talked about D&D, &D, in, uh, in the art for the druid class in third edition 3.5, I think, four, yeah, fourth and fifth, you see the figure either with antlers or with a actual like stag skull on their head. So I went into uh, into the game being like, oh, okay, we're probably going to see that. But then just the constant like, oh, that person's just wearing a human skull on their face. Ugh, that's kind of weird. And then it just kept happening and happening and happening. And then uh, we kind of talked about it and we reflected back and we were like, oh, the Daughters of Larian had that too. And then slowly over time, we kind of built up this whole perspective of, oh, there's actually a very consistent way it does this. That's weird. I got on my topic mostly thinking about... Um... It was actually Tolkien, not necessarily Dungeons and Dragons. And of course, Dungeons and Dragons and Tolkien are very, very intimately connected. Uh, but a few years ago, there was uh, an essay that had come out uh, on a blog by James Mendez Hodes that was called Orcs, Britons, and the Martial Race Myth, uh, a species built for racial terror. And in that essay, uh, the author went through and explained sort of the intellectual origins of the idea of the martial race, which was something that Tolkien actually leaned quite he heavily on in creating orcs. And I read this and I thought it was really fascinating and I thought it was great and, um, you know, connected to these sort of enlightenment ideals that, you know, went into justify imperialism and everything. And it made perfect sense to me. And then seeing it discussed on the internet from Tolkien fans and D&D fans and everything, I was struck with the, the discordant reactions, right? Like the idea that, uh, you know, people who were kind of taking this personally, saying that if they were fans of D&D or if they had played an orc character or something like that, then this guy was calling them racist. And that's not really at all what was going on, right? It was just sort of connecting this sort of pernicious ideas into something that were much, much, much deeper and much more subtle. So I actually went into this thinking that mostly the topic was going to focus on, on Tolkien and how Tolkien kind of conceived this, because his take on this is probably, un, you know, unsurprisingly, much more sophisticated uh, than it's usually expressed in D&D &D in, in an average game. Um, but when I found that, that um, you know, Gygax had deliberately called out these other three or four inspirations, I started going back and reading those and like, you know, from the first line of Burroughs, like this guy is literally, literally a Confederate captain. And throughout the series, he literally carves out this like perfect sort of antebellum Southern world using these, these red and green Martians as, as a way to just model that, that culture. And like, I hadn't read these since I was probably 12 or 13. And, you know, those just went completely, completely by me when I was that age. But so reading these things again, and kind of getting into this sort of uh, intellectual foundation of all of this, I thought was was really, really interesting. And just to just to be clear, like I do play D&D &D and I do play tabletop role playing games. And I, I'm not calling anyone who really enjoys them a racist by any means, right? It's just, there's there's a lot of intellectual elements that that predate this by hundreds of years that that is is being kind of drawn into this. Uh, and I think exploring that is really interesting. So I think that kind of transitions really nicely into um, the next question. As all of you were presenting your papers, I really noticed that each game kind of embodied different values. So, you know, Jason, just that you're able to win a game by starving the population, the association of skulls with like evilness or badness or primitiveness and also you know this you know really dated conception of race and and how that ends up informing then our perception of race as we're kind of playing these games and kind of going through these stereotypes um so i'd love to know a little bit more about you know the values that are represented in the games that are the center of your papers today and also what you attribute the source of these values to be? Where are they, where are they coming from? I think, first of all, I maybe would want to push out back slightly on the idea that there are really super discordant different values presented in each of these games. It feels like more like it's this strongly overlapping set of circles and sort of fields because a couple months ago, I was at a different conference that basically did the same thing with uh, sort of a Sanskrit Creed Valhalla uh, and the skulls, but took it using Geraldine Heng's uh, conception of 
race and racialization and sort of struck me then that you could also read this through a race focused filter or uh, also a gender focused filter and end up with something very similar. And so we've actually, I think in a lot of ways are end up tapping into some of the same undercurrents of violence, elite hegemony and ostracization that underlie a large part of historical media and our imagined past. I think even with you know the Sumerian game uh, or Hammurabi, thinking about you know, player strategies and how are we supposed to interact with a lower class, all of these end up intersecting in some really, really fascinating ways and touch on some of the same core violences, I think is the word I want to use there, that underlie a troubling amount of our culture. Uh, as for the religion specifically, I'm actually not sure where Asasri Bahala gets so much of it from because it is so overblown. It is so, so excessive that it almost obscures itself. Uh, I think the idea of you know upholding Roman, Romanitas as something really good and then upholding Christianity as a neutral default is kind of the defining feature of folkloristics, uh, especially 19th century folkloristics first, at uh, the field of religious studies second, uh, until within the last 30 years, Christianity has been seen as the default religion. And so all else should be judged according to that, even if it is antagonistic. So that's where I would say it comes from, but it's just, it's so excessive that it almost obscures its own history. If I could respond to something Adam just mentioned real quick. Uh, I, so I didn't really give exact quotes of how things got delivered, but it does, um, the Sumerian game in particular is very serious about the role playing part to it. And it does, uh, this, this steward actually, um, that the way that gets phrased, it's very much, you are actually a ruler. It, it, it referred to as the Duga. And, and oh, this, I'll give quote once I just brought the, the page up here. Sir, I'm sorry to report that 101 bushels of grain have rotted or been eaten by rats this past season. So there's, there's phrasing and implicit uh, things about you being the rule, uh, essentially, in the actual text itself. The, the kind of fortunate thing about this question with uh, um, overall the, the intent, at least, the, the overt intent is it, it lists everything. It actually, because it's an educational project, it does state exactly which educational thing you're trying to teach. Um, it is not trying to teach you should actually just not feed your population. That is accidental based on the 1969 version. Um, it, it has, I, I mean, just looking at Sumerian game again here, economic growth is necessary if the standard of living is to increase and economy is growing if there is increase of real per capita output. So there's a long list of things that just come directly from economic principles as understood in the 1960s that try to get translated into this interactive simulation plan. Um, but that, the third game, the one that I, I didn't really talk about, the free enterprise game actually comes directly from a lot of business simulations in the late 50s uh, that where, where a lot of this kind of originally comes from. Uh, so it, it's definitely steeped in uh, those economic ideas. I think values wise, it's a little tricky to go down like a tabletop RPG and talk about like what values are inculcated or, or encouraged. Like, cause we can look at like what Gygax and other writers of, of later editions intended, but that all breaks down as soon as you have a group of players playing the game, right? Because they can do something wildly different. And I know that the, the intent of like the first editions of D&D were, it's a miniature war game, right? Like it's a tactical sort of combat game with these sort of limited scenario ideas and everything. And now it's so much different and it's so much focused on these like long extended narratives. And I mean, I've been part of games that are literally revolutionary that, that are, you know, about ending slavery or about ending, you know, these sort of pernicious social elements and everything. So like, there's a lot of wide variance in how these games can actually express themselves and actually be counter to the sort of mechanical ideas that are present within the game. So, it, it's a little tricky to say that, right? Because like, as soon as I mentioned like, oh, well, D&D, &D, you know, you're going to play this monstrous race and orcs are just like arrow fodder, you know, 90 people are going to be like, well, not in my game. 
and like that's by design and that's that's great and you know it, it represents i think a something qualitatively different than a video game experience or a novel or something like that because those are in, curated intensely those have very particular ideas and very particular framings that you can't really avoid right whereas like if if you're playing a DD game and somebody keeps representing these like non-christians as like wearing skulls like a player can be like hey what's with that <laughs> what are you doing right and there's this level of interaction that you, you don't have in these other sort of curated uh approaches but you know it is i think at least partially true you can go on to you know dungeons and dragons subreddits and whatnot and see the kind of games that people are playing and you're generally probably not going to get too many people that are looking at this very critically and you're probably not going to get too many people that are looking at this from a lens of sort of historiography and where these sort of intellectual ideas came from and how they're perpetuating them through their play because they just want to play a game where you don't really have to worry about much and that's a monster and you can go kill it and you can get rewards from it right and like that itself isn't a harmful thing and i think that to an extent the the use of monster races in order to be something that is literally just arrow fodder or or monster it's actually an effort to like not be so horrible right it, you could they could very easily have used real world you know they could have put mongols or huns or you know some other sort of like racialized historical element into the game but they didn't and i think that says something about the intent like this isn't supposed to be something <laughs> that you really want to think a lot about in terms of sort of its intellectual grounding it's just something that you you play to have fun and breaking that up into the millions of different permutations and types of games people can play can be very powerful um, and it can be a very interesting way to kind of push back against the narrative that the game wants. I, I think one of the really interesting common elements you get, particularly between what we see with you know Dungeons and Dragons and then also with uh, Assassin's Creed Valhalla is how so much of when we imagine the past, the present just perpetually bleeds back into it. So, you know, most people who are exposed to Christianity modernly in the West don't see relics. Like I, I have seen, you know, like the mummified hand of St. Francis Xavier in a, a cathedral one time, but like they're not on display. We don't associate human remains with Christianity. Whereas in the medieval period, it absolutely is a thing. You know, there's a, there's a shield in the Assassin's Creed Valhalla that we kept talking about because it has uh, human skulls lashed to the front. And it's like, oh, spooky pagan. And it's like, this would be the, this would, you fucking make those the heads of three different saints. That is an ideal, like, reliquary like you know you like going into war with that there's oh god adam you'll remember it, who, who is the saint whose body keeps getting brought out for battles to bless oh, these ahead of time i i don't remember i it's was one thinking of, the of Northern Britain the, ones, I, think. I was thinking of the book that's trapped oh. to the front of the shield for was it it's Sam? a columba, a columba uh, yeah saint, yeah saint columba has the, the the first plagiarism book that he stole uh before he got exiled from ireland um, like there's so many of these ideas of the present that just fade into the, into the past. So like modern ideas of like how we perceive race and all that gets us thrust into the past. Whereas like D and D tends to take place in a miscellaneously medieval in that it's like, oh yeah, it's like early medieval. It's eventually the 15th century, but that's early medieval. You have battles with thousands and thousands of people in trenches that last days and days and months, but it's early medieval. This isn't just us talking about World War, World War I in a new and exciting way. Um, but yeah, it's it's such a common idea when we imagine our past, or even when we imagine fantastic pasts, the modern just shows up in it entirely unintentionally. Speaking of that link, actually, Jason, I wanted to ask you a question. Uh, in the discussion sort of report document, do they mention at all like why they chose Sumer as a historical time period for this game, and then Sierra Leone for the more modern representation? of this economic attempted simulation? Um, I did actually, uh, I mean, I brought up partly why the Sierra Leone game was was uh, picked in, in the actual talk because uh, there were, they were really wanting, because Africa really had a lot of newly independent um, countries at the time. They, they were, that was really very important for them to think about what was gonna happen next. Uh, but a, a lot of them had very complex things going on, like vast murder that were not, they didn't want to try to simulate that for sixth graders. 
So they uh, picked uh, one that they could reduce to the economic issues. And it, I mean, it, it may be their, their justification in the document is a little bit like, it may be because they just happened to have this friend in the UN who was from Sierra Leone. They, they, that might have actually been part of it too. There was there was sort of a, a back justification for it, for it, but it doesn't mention that in the report. That, that does seem like a, a reasonably logical uh, reason. Um, Sumeria is also a really interesting choice. And this has to do with the history of education because it was actually kind of on the ways out in the 60s um, in terms of teaching uh, some of these ancient things. And they were really trying to find a way to bring it back. So they, they were, how can we update this, make it current is, was sort of the feeling I, I got from reading it. Um, and so it, it was actually against the current to, to put the Sumerian thing and pick that, that as the, pick that as the location. So. It does actually mention um, religion too in there. So uh, you're, you're talking about uh, Christianity with the other things. Uh, it does, one of the things that can happen is that um, it says that people have angered our God and I might be pronouncing this wrong, Ningrisa? No, Ningursa. Um, and that there's a fire that, that goes across the fields and you just ask after crops. That's one of the random events. That can happen. The, this is actually lost in all the other later versions. The second version, because there's only crammed a giant space. Again, we can't, they just basically do play. It's the only really random event in, in the, the version after because it, they can't fit all these things. But they really did put a thought to let's make all the events match this time period and even mention their religion. And they did really, I mean, I mean again, they're. The, beforehand, it was basically like an animated cutscene. Essentially, they had slideshow with recorded audio that was supposed to go before. It. Unfortunately, we don't have all the slides. Um, this is still an ongoing thing, and part of the reason why I didn't want to reconstruct the Sumerian game is uh, I think we can do a better job of it. Um, we, we need to, to extract some more information, I think, before we can do a, a, a really good showing of that. But there are. Um, a lot of background that it tries to feed beforehand, really trying to teach and make alive this time period. Um, so speaking of that, um, what kind of methods would each of you find or do you find um, effective for studying the history of games or the portrayal of history within games? Um, so you've got kind of related topics that you're all working with. Um, but they're all kind of different as well. And, um, you know, do you use similar methods when you're doing this kind of work or have each of you used um, different approaches when, when coming up with, with these papers and doing this work? Games are, are interesting because <clears throat> I think there's not, so far there's not like a, a really big sort of historiography about them. So a lot of, a lot of the information that we can get is from like gaming journalism um, or like I've more or less just went and read at least you know the the sort of character creation elements of almost all of the D and D books that I could get my hands on, um, and you know no one to my knowledge has really gone through and sort of deconstructed that in you know using historical methodology. And so like obviously this is just very kind of superficial, just sort of like hey look it's related, <laughs> right? Just kind of throw it on the wall. But you know there is a lot of gaming journalism, um, and there is a lot of writing and I, I I don't even know how to describe it like especially role-playing games have a lot of like sort of supplementary writing that's about like how to better run games and some of those are about how to better incorporate sort of real world or historical reality into games and that's like a really big sort of subgenre of like the advice genre of running games and whatnot um, and it's you know to various to various qualities uh some of them are, are you know not very great advice and some of it is is actually really really interesting but um in terms of actually like studying this stuff as history i actually remember a few years ago at gen con there was a tiny museum that was set up um in the middle of like the they had a stadium set up with a bunch of other games and whatnot and they had this tiny museum that was like the history of, of role-playing games and it was focused on D, &D but it had all uh, all kinds of like first editions and um you know, Gygax's dice and a few other things that were set up. And it was like, you know, the Gen Con, this thing that sprawls across half of Indianapolis. And it's, um, you know, this thing, it's probably about the size of the room that I'm in right now, you know, and like kind of just like 
bookshelves with stuff on them rather than like a really curated kind of museum experience. But I wouldn't be surprised if I saw more of that kind of thing, especially since like, um, it seems like over the past few years that tabletop role playing has become a lot more mainstream and it's become a lot more popular. Um, and now like new people are kind of getting in and they're realizing like D and D's sort of the default starting point, but it, it, it isn't for everybody and it isn't something that you have to play. There are tons of other games out there. And I think that it kind of builds this sort of fascination of like, where did this come from and what are these initial ideas? And especially like, where are the alternatives and where did they come from? Because some of those are reactions to D and D. Some of them come from totally different directions. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if we saw more uh, of that sort of like historical journalism about where exactly these things come from. Um, I think, I think we're still a little behind the curve in terms of like having like proper sort of historiographical studies of this kind of thing. But I, I would be really interested to see those when they, when they start coming out. Yeah, I think digital games are luckily in not quite uh, as dire of a situation in terms of being behind the times. There's the last roughly 15 years have seen a ridiculously large amount of scholarship all come out at the same time. Uh, 2013 and 2016 were two really good years for scholarship. Uh, but even so, we're at the point where there's a ton of theoretical approaches and not a whole lot of lot of work has been done to actually test those approaches by applying them to games. There's been a lot, just more, throw more theories at the wall because there's such great diversity in styles of just digital games, not to mention tabletop board games, role-playing games, etc., etc., etc. Uh, that it's hard to get just a single methodology that works even slightly competently on a broad scale. So certainly for this paper, we pretty much took a theory neutral approach, right? We just, we did much the same thing you did, Adam, where we saw the thing, we sort of just went through the material present in the game, uh, not quite data mining, but certainly trying to be rigorous about catching all of the end state visible material and then from there construct some sort of narrative or typology to think about this one game in particular i don't think our typology works for any other game it just is a what stuck for this one so a, very much a similar methodology to what you did but i will say more broadly i think jason uh, you pointed out that actually playing the game is really important for analysis. I think across the board for all of us, that's a true statement where the most important thing, no matter what theoretical methodology or historical framework you're using, you've got to actually play the game and see if what the player is able to do and the way that these are presented for the player to interact with actually stands, holds up with what you think is going on and how that reflects on how historical actors would have interacted with this. So uh, I think that's probably the most specific uh, broad advice I would have is just you've got to play the game and you've got to play whatever you're working with a lot. To, to build on that, I think another really important element is but, but obviously playing it yourself, but then looking at how other people are playing it. So um, you know, with Assassin's Creed Valhalla, it engages with a lot of things that we see from other pieces of pop culture earlier on. So the idea, so the, the, the way druids are depicted in it, they have lots of like nature and animalistic features that as far back as I've been able to figure it out, goes back to the earliest edition of D&D, &D, which is drawing on a probably very shaky translation of Pliny the Elder's works. And this is where all this idea of like druids do stuff with nature and druids transform into animals and it's like that's not what druids do at any point in any Celtic society but sure but what's really important for to me is looking at how the general public engages and consumes this information so uh, there are like various online communities that I keep an eye on where every few like weeks or so I would just like throw druid into us into the search bar and just look at what everybody's been saying and being like okay all right I can see how people are engaging with this um 
and like how it, you know a lot of these things tie back uh, together again, um, the way in which people then, when they are, are imagining their own uh, fantasy worlds, uh, when they're making games, be it digital games or games like uh, D&D, how then these kind of continuously feed back into themselves. So uh, Dungeons and Dragons presents, oh, Druids are this part of a, like a forgotten past. And like you go on with that and then this results in Assassin's Creed Valhalla going, oh yeah, Ireland land, like a mysterious kind of like land stuck in the past. We're gonna go there, there's gonna be pagans. And it's like, there's not been pagans here for like 300 years, guys. They are, they're not like, you know, Ireland uses um, Iron Age, not Iron Age, Bronze Age swords throughout the entirety of the game. Like there's all these images, like it's the past, it's super distant, but it's not really the, what's actually the case. But then this educates people and this is how they should understand things. That these things are part of the past, that there are pagans in every bush in Ireland in the ninth century, um, when that's really not the case. But you, as a historian, you only really see that when you look at how the general public is processing this information they're being given. I think a, a big advantage for the tabletop thing is, is the popularity of something like Critical Role, right? Where they, you can see like how the game in action is used with people who are, you know, they're not, I wouldn't say the Critical Role people are average gamers by any means. Um, and I honestly think one of the, you know, the biggest mistakes I think uh, aspiring GMs want to make is like they want to, they want to play Critical Role, right? Rather than play D&D &D with like the advantages their group has, you know? Um, but it is really interesting to see how easily and how quickly like the the sort of foundation that's set up by D&D or in this case Pathfinder or something like that um, can start changing just based on like how the game is played and you know whether or not the characters relate to an NPC or whether or not the characters like are interested in the sort of the overarching narrative or you know the 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 main antagonist or something like that and I know that I've played games where I introduce like a major antagonist and everybody just like sort of yawns and then there's just like a guy that I panic and make up at the last minute who becomes a major feature of the rest of the game. And like, it's, it's really hard to predict stuff like that. And the best games are the ones that sort of just take that and roll with it. And that can have really surprising consequences across the game. But like seeing that kind of thing in action and seeing how, uh, how a game can sort of develop from its sort of natural inputs like that, I think is really important for sort of seeing kind of in general how the game can be uh, really dynamic, but how, you know, it's also sort of like a, a starting state, right? You know, if you could sit in on a hundred different session zeros of, of, uh, of a game of D&D, like how different would each be? And then compare that to like 20 games down the line and how wildly different things could, could get. And I think that, you know, um, the popularity of the kind of actual play kind of thing is, is, a, is a boon for this kind of thing. So Jason, kind of given all that and how important it seems to be to actually be able to play the game and to watch other people play the game, what do you, what do, you do? How does that affect your ability to, to do research on the kinds of games that, that you look at? Uh, I mean, certainly uh, it's where it was especially trouble uh, is there, there was a, a game from the early 70s um, called Hunt the Wumpus that had a um, another series developed at the same time called Caves. Caves is totally obscure. Wampus happens to be the mascot of Discord. So people know about Wampus even they don't know about the game it came from. The, the Caves is like, like totally obscure, even though it was probably actually came a little bit before Wampus. Um, and one of the versions of that was kind of like a, a, a tiny mug. It, it was uh, the People's Caves. I think it was the name of it. I'm trying to do this off the top of my head. I mean, public caves, the public caves. Um, and I, I really couldn't get a sense just playing it on my own because this was meant to be a multiplayer experience. So I had to set up, I actually got a, there was a conference called Neuroscope where I, I had somebody set up a computer with this uh, 1973 game. And they had people actually go in and you, basically you get to add in graffiti into this cave and add rooms to it. And so then afterwards, it was, you could actually see the finished product that was created by the people as a group. Um, and I got a little insight of like how people were thinking of this, this device, which I couldn't get by just doing it on my own. So sometimes I, I, I can play it on my own and get a sense of what others would think, but it also certainly helps if somebody else has and I can, I can read their approach and 
sometimes they'll notice things I don't like. I would not have tried the don't feed your your people at all strategy. This, this and this is racist too. I don't think I was ever written about this until I, I think it was six months ago. Um, it might even be, be more recent. So it is people will because it's an interact experience. There's so many different approaches to it. There's no way you yourself can see every different angle. So we've touched on this um, a little bit already, but I want to ask more directly. Um, intentionally, as in you know, the case with Jason, the game that you talked about, um, where it was actually designed and developed as an educational game, or you know, kind of unintentionally, as we've seen in the case with Adam, Adam and Emmett and and D and D and in uh, Assassin's Creed Valhalla, each game, each of these games seem to teach their players something either about history or about current events. Um, and so, I wanted to ask a little bit about you know what kinds of lessons do you think players are learning from your games, and what kind of impact do you think that these lessons then have on you know their understanding of the topic at hand. I think a big part about what, uh, at least the part of Assassin's Creed Valhalla that I play the most attention to, the Ireland DLC, uh, it teaches people how to perceive this part of this part of the world in the past. The Irish government, I believe, like last month, spent fifty thousand euro on. I, I think it was fifty thousand on using Assassin's Creed, this specific DLC to be like, oh, look at Ireland's ancient past. Isn't it cool? There's druids and this and this and this and it's like that's not. That's wrong. That's really wrong. But it, it's what the Irish government would love to be able to present it as, as it passed. It's like that's like, but so then this then got shown to the general public. They go, oh, Ireland, Druids, strange, mysterious, you know, world in the mist. Like, oh, how strange and otherworldly they are. And it's like, no. Uh, but it, that's what's taught to people, and that's what people learn from it. Yeah, I, I think the same thing is true, just more broadly, but. You know, Assassin's Creed Valhalla presents a very generically medieval, I mean, there are 14th century ruined castles bumming around 9th century England, as if that somehow holds together. Uh, but there's this really interesting thing where I think most of the education, uh, unless if someone deliberately goes through and makes it educational, uh, as will happen with the Discovery Tour that has already been confirmed to be coming out, or what the Irish government did, or what honestly I myself do. A lot of that becomes really subconscious education, because if you asked people or complain about any history in the game, like I did repeatedly here on Reddit, the most common response of is, it's obviously fantastical, stop worrying about it. Specifically rejecting the idea that this game can or is inherently teaching people things. But that's, of course, not true. And it won't teach everyone things. Uh, some recent research uh, in games led by Robert Hodden uh, is suggesting that, you know, even deliberately educational games don't aren't very effective for people who don't like gaming. Shocking, I know. Uh, but there are genuine limits to its educational value. But I think what the game mostly does is just quietly reinforces the popular cultural imagining of a time period. So Assassin's Creed Valhalla is clearly responding to History Channel's Vikings TV show. It's reinforcing that same image of sexy, undercut, heavily tattooed super warriors. Fine. Whether or not that is actually educational or whether that makes people fundamentally research or think about the Viking Age differently, we still don't fully know, but it's definitely part of this uh, reinforcement, slight challenging, but mostly just continuing to build on and cement this new-ish popular cultural image of the Viking Age. I think, um, you know, uh, again, kind of uh, owing the fact that like the, the variance of play in something like D&D &D is it, nothing can be considered really universal. But I do think that <clears throat> one of the things that people sort of take away from playing games like D&D &D is you can kind of take its sort of organizational structure and hurl it into the past and it just makes total sense like one of my other hobbies is historical fencing and we get people who come into historical fencing all the time who will look at a sword and they'll say well that's not 
X, it's Y. And that comes from D and D, right? That comes from that D and D labels certain weapons in a certain way because you need to in order for the game to be playable. But then they take that categorization and just apply it as if that's the real thing, right? Like, oh, that's not a catapult, that's a mangonel. Without really realizing that, like most of the time, like you know, if you're writing about siege weapons in the 14th century, like they just call it whatever they called it at the time, and like it's not a big deal. Right. The same with like a hand and a half sword versus a long sword versus an arming sword. And like all of these things, I think, are elements of the sort of the structure of a game like D&D because they have to be consistent in order for things to, to come out in predictable ways. Um, but when you take that kind of organizational schema and apply it to the past, really weird things happen. And that's where a lot of, I think, the sort of historical misnomers come from, like the idea that we can take a whole race of people or a whole culture of people and sort of power level them as saying they are more, you know, more warlike or they're more impressive or more successful because this, this, and the, and people will just sort of break this stuff down without really intending to in a way that, that makes it sort of fit within D and D. Right. And you can even see like people will you know, share memes and stuff about like some historical event and they'll, they'll say, Oh, clearly, you know, that was the paladin of the party doing this and this and, and like, it's, it's that, that sort of inverse kind of channel of, of applying sort of an understanding of the world that's presented through game mechanics into the real world and sort of importing these ideas and applying them as if, as if they actually make sense without really thinking about it. Um, and I think ultimately it's that, that kind of like categorization, right? The idea that everything can fit into a neat little box and that little box has literal quantitative tags that you can apply generally to everything. And I think, especially if you want to study something like medieval or early modern history, like that is very harmful. Like that's going to set you back a lot in understanding anything that goes on because things are so wildly variant, right? And like trying to play a game set in the real world using D&D mechanics would get weird very fast uh, because it just, it, it just wasn't quite as neatly organized as we like it to be. Well, thank you all so much. Um, I really enjoyed hearing all your different presentations and the responses to all the questions and the really interesting discussion that we had. Um, we're now going to transition to hearing your closing thoughts. So we're just going to start first with Jason. I just want to point out that um, there really is a lot of value in these older games that don't get a lot of recognition or knowledge. And it really is worth trying some of them, even if, if they're very, very old. You, you can get some game design lessons that apply to things today. You can see patterns that apply to very recent games. So the, the same patterns that are in Sumerian game, uh, really uh, the, the narrative structure follows things like modern paradox strategy games. So it, it really is worthwhile to see those, what they do. I just like to thank everyone here at the Ask Historians Digital Conference and the rest of our panelists, uh, Adam and Jason. This has been a fabulous conversation and definitely has added a lot to think about within our own research, uh, how across uh, game genre, across game style and across time, how really quite a few of the same features keep showing up. I'd also like to thank Emmett and everyone else who has helped me with thinking about talking about way too much about a Sasprey Valhalla and all of the things that it is doing. Yeah, and I'd like to thank Adam for inviting me on to his stream uh, way back and getting all this started up. Uh, I have uh, want to thank my university library, University College Cork, for uh, scanning every single document I needed them to do for this, uh, which I really appreciate. Uh, and just for all of you uh, watching out there, uh, just Hey, engage your engage your favorite pieces of pop culture and media critically. Like think about what they're telling you. Think about everything about them, and be very skeptical of everything they tell you about druids. Um, okay, yeah, I think again, like the the nature of tabletop role playing games really lend themselves to this kind of uh, analysis, right? Like this sort of you are, as a game master or a player are much more in control of the narrative and much more in control of elements that make it make their way into the game world than you are in other games. And so I think being aware of the kind of intellectual ideas, these sort of little pernicious elements um, can really help in, in, in creating, I think, a, a much more nuanced, much more welcoming um, and 
sort of diverse set of players, right? And, you know, one of the, the big issues in gaming in general, gaming culture right now is the sort of culture war about um, who identifies as gamers and, and whose voices are allowed in, in games. And the nice thing about like a tabletop role-playing game like D&D is that it's literally only the people that are sitting there at your table. And, you know, you are much more in control of that than you are about the other people whose favorite game happens to be your favorite game because, you know, you might find yourself in, in some uh, uh, different company than you might expect uh, if you're interested in, say, Vikings or Old Sumeria or something like that. Um, and I think, like, you know, not to castigate anybody for enjoying these sort of cliches and traits as they've made up, because, again, they're a huge bulk of the, uh, the kind of background radiation of, of these games. But um, we can help combat this by simply by just being aware of the influence of these old theories, uh, and not only just in the gaming world, but in the world outside it as well. And I think that if games can, and I think they can, um, help to educate us about this kind of history, then I think we'll be in a better place to not only make better games, but also to be sort of better people and more responsible people outside of the games. So once again, thank you to all the panelists. Um, again, this is such a great discussion. Um, and thank you to everyone attending the Ask Us Reigns Digital Conference. This concludes our panel session for today. <laughs>